Hello again. I'm Susan Amara, the president of AAAS and the chair of this year's annual meeting. I'd like to welcome you all today's plenary session featuring Dr. Catalin Carrico. We're thrilled that Dr. Carrico can be with us to discuss her remarkable career and one of the most important scientific advances of our generation, one that is truly leading us um, to the other side of a global pandemic. Today's session is brought to us by the generous support of Johnson & Johnson, a member of the AAAS Corporate Circle and a longtime supporter of the AAAS Annual Meeting. J&J's support of some of um, AAAS's flagship programs, including our Mass Media Fellowships, now in their 45th year, and tomorrow's Minority and Women in Science Award Ceremony have provided really critical funding to our programs that powerfully advance our mission. Johnson & Johnson is represented by a longtime friend to AAAS, Seema Kumar, Global Head of the Office of Innovation, Global Health and Scientific Engagement. Following Dr. Carrico's talk, Seema will lead us in a fireside chat. It is now my pleasure to hand things over to Seema. Thank you, thank you, Susan, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it is such a great pleasure to be here at this uh, AAAS meeting. I wish we could have all met, um, you know, in person, because I always loved, enjoyed so much being in person at AAAS and doing all of the networking. Unfortunately, we have to do it virtually, but thanks to technology, we can. And so I want to, first of all, thank you for joining us virtually. I hope everybody's staying safe and well. Um, well, this plenary is going to be inspiring and energizing, um, to say the least. And it's also going to be a reminder that science is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Perseverance is sometimes half the battle of science. And at the end, it's always worth it, as you will hear from Dr. Catalan Carico. I'm so honored to be here speaking with and introducing Catalan Carico, Dr. Catalan Carico, who was who I met actually uh, September of last year when we presented her, uh, uh, as well as her colleague Dr. Drew Weissman with the Johnson and Johnson Dr. Polly Johnson Award for Biomedical Research. The two of them were honored for their groundbreaking work on mRNA research that enabled the development of several COVID-19 vaccines. And of course, it also holds tremendous promise for future applications in both vaccines as well as therapeutics. The work of Dr. Carico began several decades ago, and despite her belief in the power of mRNA, her research was not fully supported or funded. And flash forward to 2021 with you know, more than 4.79 billion people across the globe having received at least one dose of the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine, the world could not be more grateful for her perseverance and for her belief in continuing to stay the course on mRNA research. We'll hear a little bit more about her story during our fireside chat, uh, but in the meantime, I will first turn it over to Dr. Carrico for her presentation. Catlin, can I turn it over to you? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Seema. Um, <laughs> so I, I am very delighted to be here. Actually, I am in Philadelphia, and I wish that all of the uh, listeners and the uh, watch of this program would be here. But um, today I will present, uh, and if I can have my slides here on the screen, then I can tell you about um, the development of mRNA for therapy. Do you see it? Something. So I just put here there a quote. The path of scientific discovery is never straight line. It has twists and turns in every juncture. And pass of scientific, uh, and, and uh, what I suggest to those who, who are at the beginning of their career to stay on the track and no matter how long and winding that road might be. So can you make it uh, that I can see the sl my slide? Because I can just see Sima at present. Oh. 
let's see i don't I know can, I okay. Will... okay i i i can i can navigate from here i have okay. a, so um talking about uh, you know the mrna development for therapy so the next slide shows that actually uh, it started with the discovery of uh, uh, the messenger RNA, and uh, this was in 1961. And uh, it took 60 years that we had the first uh, mRNA vaccine developed and uh, approved by the FDA. And uh, during these 60 years, you know, the major uh, uh, important uh, milestone were 1978 when isolated mRNA was delivered into mammalian cell and it could be translated in 1984 when first time messenger RNA could be synthesized in a tube. In 1990 when the messenger RNA was injected into uh, uh, in the mice and then the mRNA uh, translated to the protein. 2000 was when we discovered that um, uh, the actually the mRNA was inflammatory, and 2005 we come up with a, you know a solution for that. And 2017, when LMP formulated modified RNA formulated in lipid nanoparticle was used as a vaccine. I um, mostly remember all of this. The first one, not in '61. I was just six years old, and I couldn't even read in Hungarian, not that English. So I was not reading. Uh, Nature and other journals, but the rest of it I remember because I was uh, following uh, this uh, field for that long. And um, even before uh, discovering the uh, messenger RNA, the next slide shows that scientists wonder about that. Um, uh, what could be that, how could it be that in the nuclei, the chromosome is present and then actually the translation occurring somewhere in the cytoplasm at the ribosome and, and how the information is coming from the uh, nuclei, from the chromosome to the ribosome. And um, so just um, uh, making uh, interesting uh, experiments and of course realizing that the ribosome has uh, uh, some RNA, and so what they did actually using the bacterial uh, bacteria, the next slide shows what uh, they have done is that uh, they isolated DNA from bacteria and then uh, they also isolated RNA from the same bacteria. What was interesting is here uh, is showing uh, that uh, these different bacteria has different GC content. And when they looked at the RNA, the RNA had the same GC content. So the scientists, uh, actually this was uh, Spirin and colleagues in, in uh, Russia, they realized that uh, this RNA cannot be, you know, the messenger RNA because it seemed like it was all composed the same. Today we know that it was all ribosomal RNA. So the scientists had to look further and the next slide shows that um, in uh, uh, two, they published in two papers. The next slide shows is that um, it was published in actually in uh, in Nature. And what was interesting, you can see that both of the paper mentioned that it is an unstable uh, molecule because you know in uh, in that case, for example, in bacteria, it is a couple of minutes and the RNA degrades. So of course, uh, scientists now that um, based on these uh, discoveries. Uh, established what we know today. The next slide shows it uh, that um, what is the information flow. So that, uh, you know, the information is coming from the DNA. On the next slide, please. And uh, it uh, transcribed to the RNA and RNA is uh, translated to the protein. Of course, the scientists could, uh, you know, uh, identify the RNA, but uh, they, they could not uh, synthesize it. So what they did, they could uh, isolate. And that's what they started to work with. So the next slide shows that what they have done. So they realized that the reticulocytes, which is the precursor of, uh, of the red blood cells, enriched for one type of RNA. And uh, they could uh, separate this RNA. It come uh, separated, it was between the tRNA and the 18S RNA, and this fraction, uh, fraction they collected, and actually this contains the beta globin, which is very enriched in the reticulocyte. And, um, and then they translated this in a, a, a rabbit, a rabbit reticulocyte lysate, and they identified 
that it is uh, most helpful. They they uh, used um, uh, they used the uh, radio labeled uh, uh, amino acid to detect that. And uh, in a later studies in seventy one, and uh, it was shown that when they the same isolated RNA injected to the frog oocyte, it also translated to this protein. So these were the first uh, RNA delivery experiments in uh, in the uh, very early sixties. While scientists, you know, try to develop uh, essays that how to deliver, other scientists, the next slide shows, were working on to figure out what could be the structure of this RNA, this new messenger RNA, which was discovered. And uh, in 1975, probably was the year of the cap, because uh, they discovered independently here in New Jersey, in Japan, and in Australia, that it has a five prime, very interesting, uh, they called in uh, this paper in the bizarre five prime uh, terminus. And um, I put here the picture of Yanu uh, uh, Thomas, who is an uh, uh, organic chemist, and he synthesized the cap uh, structure and sent it to the scientists to identify so they have a reference material. And Yanu uh, uh, Thomas uh, became my PhD advisor. So when I started there in my PhD in 78, actually, I knew that the messenger RNA has a cap structure. Here I may mention that um, in the same year, Bernard Bons at NIH also discovered the enzyme identified that uh, vaccinia virus has a, a specific uh, protein, an enzyme, which can uh, cap the viral uh, RNA. Uh, Scientists uh, uh, advanced further, and the next slide shows with the delivery because they were excited to deliver the RNA. So, you, you know, many of you are surprised that the RNA was delivered, and uh, which is something very new. But uh, you can see here that 1978 they already have done that. In this state, at that time also they used uh, isolated uh, uh, reticle, uh, isolated rabbit uh, 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 globin RNA, and this was from uh, uh, rabbit, the rabbit reticulocyte, uh, rabbit, rabbit reticulocyte. And uh, what they did actually, they uh, put it into the liposome. The liposome was actually invented in the same time that the RNA was discovered. It was 1961 and uh, Oleg Mangham was uh, the father of the liposome. And uh, here the scientists uh, put uh, the, uh, around the RNA and this uh, protected this liposome, which was uh, phosphatidylserine ethanolamine containing phos phospholipid liposome. And they put uh, and uh, it had the RNA to fuse to primary cells. Actually, they use here mouse spleen lymphocytes, and um, they could detect uh, with uh, immunoprecipitation that the, the RNA was translated. So this was published in two uh, paper, back to the paper in, in Nature in 1978. So I consider that was the first RNA delivery uh, experiment. We were reading about actually in this experiment and was excited. And uh, the next slide shows now that my involvement is started here, because in um, 1970s I started to work in the lipid laboratory first, and uh, there we did uh, generated liposomes and. Uh, and we delivered at that time, it was a plasmid. We did not know how to, or we didn't try to isolate RNA. But uh, for me, I am mentioning this uh, time because it was so important. This was the first experiment I was doing with, with uh, 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 mentors and it influenced me. Later, I was keep thinking about this uh, very first uh, experiment. And um, so I did a lot of lipid related research, but when I uh, uh, finished, uh, my studies and uh, I started my PhD, actually I went to the RNA laboratories. And here actually not working with RNA, next slide shows, it was, uh, I was working with, uh, with a, a small two prime, five prime linked oligoadenylate. And the next slide, you can see that. And uh, these uh, molecules was, uh, you know, I started in 78 and they were just discovered in 1977. Uh, Ian Kerr in London discovered that this uh, short um, RNA, two prime, five prime RNA is responsible for the interferon induced uh, antiviral effect. And uh, we decided that we very much need an uh, antiviral compound. And, you know, even today we know that how important antiviral compound is. So my role was to make uh, this, uh, 
molecule, enzymatically, chemically, and uh, this uh, oligoadenate synthesis was the enzyme which can, in our body, can polymerize from ATP. And I might mention here the oligoadenate synthesis is very important antiviral uh, molecule. This is an enzyme in our body. And uh, those who actually uh, uh, could uh, synthesize less of this enzyme, they were more prone to get uh, seriously sick from uh, coronavirus, which turned out. So the function of this small molecule is that it activates RNA cell latent uh, uh, nuclease, and then it degrades uh, the RNA, all of them, not just the viral RNA, but that was uh, what was uh, believed at that time. So my uh, love for RNA started here in the 70s because I learned how to handle them, how to label them, and uh, so it was an exciting time. I uh, moved to the United States and um, I still worked on the same uh, two prime, five prime link uh, molecules, but when here the important uh, uh, antiviral compound would have been uh, needed, that uh, you know the H HIV uh, uh, was very serious in 1985, 86, and but we this molecule, this two prime five prime linked molecule, was not uh, good for that. So when we in the next slide shows that in this point, uh, you know, here in um, 86, so we uh, started to use double stranded RNA. This was a mismatch double stranded RNA, and we tried to induce the patient uh, interferon system. Unfortunately, it did not help the HIV patient because, for, because uh, you know, the interferon uh, mechanism is uh, compromised and uh, so we couldn't induce that. So, but uh, uh, by that time, it, it is about uh, 88, when uh, I am already working with the short RNA, with the long double stranded RNA delivery problem and others, and um, Meanwhile, in the field, uh, at the same time, it uh, started to move on, and that was the, you know, the mRNA, because uh, as we, I'm showing the next slide, in 1984, when uh, mRNA could be synthesized, synthesized in, a, in a tube. So it happened, as the next slide shows, in, um, in the laboratory in uh, Harvard University, Douglas Melton and, and uh, Paul Krieg uh, performed this um, experiment and published uh, in uh, 1984. Interestingly, so what was important is that they uh, realized that using a phage uh, RNA polymerase is the answer to make uh, RNA in vitro. Prior to that, uh, you can see publication where bacterial uh, uh, RNA polymerase was used but uh, those, uh, you know, problem was the promoter, the fidelity here, the phage polymerase required very short promoter, it's a very high fidelity, and so that's what they used. That first uh, RNA, what they synthesized and published, it was coding for human beta interferon. And uh, they did the capping with uh, the capping enzyme from Bernard Most, and then so the RNA had the characteristic 5 primary UTR, 3 prime UTR, polyethyl, and the codic sequence. So when they synthesized, they injected the next slide shows um, into the uh, uh, frog oocyte, site, and uh, when they cultured these, they injected a couple of uh, frog oocyte, and when they cultured these frog oocyte, those secreted the uh, functional. Uh, interferon beta, and they were functional, they inhibit uh, viral proliferation. So this was a, a very important breakthrough, and not just because now that we could make uh, RNA in a tube uh, as we designed, but um, it was also because this was a time when uh, molecular biology advanced and, um, and, uh, and became uh, the tools, for example, here, the sp 6 RNA polymerase was commercially available in the same year when it was uh, this was published. In addition, I might mention here that uh, at that time, uh, in a, I was working at University of Pennsylvania and I requested uh, Paul Krieg for this plasmid and he put in an envelope and he sent me. There were no MTA was signed at that time. So it was like uh, the old days when everybody tried to have the others. Um, the next uh, important uh, step in the 
next slide shows that instead of you know injecting individually a cell that of course is not feasible but uh, you know the lipofectin was introduced and it was 1987 again when the publication came out then the product was commercially available and other products the same way the trizor for example chomchinsky published it how easy now to isolate RNA with it and it was also available and uh, what was important that um, uh, this uh, lipofectin is a positively charged uh, uh, lipid and the uh, nucleic acid is negatively charged that it was mixed protected and then delivered to the mammalian cells and uh, the first time RNA was next slide shows uh, was uh, 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 Robert Malone and colleagues uh, delivered with RNA to the uh, mammalian cells. So compared to the 78 uh, publication where I demonstrated that, you know, RNA was delivered in primary cells, here it was the RNA was not isolated, but rather it was uh, in vitro transcribed, but uh, otherwise um, it was a very similar experiment. So next step was in our field was 1990, as the next slide shows. And the following slide, because uh, that was when uh, uh, when uh, uh, um, John Wolf published that he injected uh, mice with uh, luciferase coding RNA, and this was a naked RNA because the lipofectin was not really used. It, it, lipofectin helped uh, move forward the project in cultured cells, but in uh, animals, those were toxic. So most of the in vivo experiment was in uh, naked naked RNA, just like here. And subsequently in the 90s, the next slide, I listed a couple of uh, major um, findings. In 92, when uh, vasopressin mRNA was used um, in rats and uh, it was uh, Floyd Bloom at um, uh, Scrip uh, could fix this uh, special uh, Rotlaboro rats and uh, uh, treated them successfully. 93 and 94 was the two papers when first time messenger RNA was used as a vaccine for infectious disease, and that was for influenza. Uh, for uh, Martinon and Maolian, they were in working in France, and then actually they used liposome, similar what we were doing in Hungary, so, and, um, and uh, delivered uh, messenger RNA. And um, subsequently, most of the studies were focused on a cancer vaccine. And that was in uh, 95 was the first time, uh, first paper came out, uh, Curiel, Conry, and uh, Alabama, they uh, used naked RNA for vaccination with uh, cancer antigen. And uh, uh, Eli Gilboa at um, uh, Duke University did, uh, did a lot of studies and uh, uh, he used human dendritic cells and he, uh, that, uh, he generated the vaccine ex vivo so that uh, he moved on uh, and uh, uh, established a company, Merix. This was Merix was in 1997 was the first uh, RNA company and uh, they uh, uh, initiated clinical trial where they generated human dendritics from human PBNC dendritic cells and treated them ex vivo with uh, two more specific uh, 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 messenger RNA and uh, those were injected back to the patient. And later this uh, Merix became Argos, the company, but uh, unfortunately their clinical trial were uh, stopped due to futility. While all of these scientists were working on, on uh, in vivo studies, I um, uh, joined cardiology and um, the next slide shows in the uh, University of Pennsylvania and I also started to use uh, uh, messenger RNA uh, together with Elliot Barnett and who, was, uh, uh, who is a cardiologist and, uh, and actually working in Johnson & Johnson. And, and uh, but at that time we worked together at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, we were interested in uh, intima thickening and uh, that's what we um, uh, generated messenger RNA coding for urokinase receptor and I am just showing this example we did other studies but uh, the urokinase receptor to be functional needed extensively modified and um, uh, so glycosylated uh, GPI links so that and and 
mRNA was delivered to the cell and then cell knew what to do with it. And then we could uh, measure functional receptor on the cell surface. So at that point, we thought that yes, the RNA will be good for something. But unfortunately, Elliot left, and so I moved over to neurosurgery. And the uh, next slide shows that uh, what we tried to do here, we did uh, a nitric oxide encoding um, RNA, tried to uh, treat, um, uh, for a goal was to treat a patient who had subarachnoid hemorrhage and get a major blood vessel constriction, and maybe local delivery of the nitric oxide synthase would help uh, what we argue. So again, mRNA is not the drug. The mRNA codes for a protein, and usually that has the beneficial effect, could be therapeutic. But uh, in that case, for example, it is an enzyme which codes for a, uh, a product which has like the nitric oxide with a millisecond half life. So in that case, the nitric oxide is uh, what is the drug. We also synthesize different kind of RNA because uh, you know these are antioxidant enzyme encoding RNA catalase, glutathione peroxide, superoxide dispotase because it was thought at that point that maybe the uh, stroke uh, patient would benefit if uh, you know antioxidant uh, enzymes would be higher level present. So we did a lot of uh, experiments and we meantime we constantly improved the mRNA on uh, a way that more protein was produced from it. So I was um, working on the neurosurgery and actually I worked there for 17 years, so all of the way to 2013. But uh, meanwhile, when uh, David left and uh, I met uh, Drew Weissman actually, and the next slide shows uh, uh, that I met uh, Drew at um, really at the Xerox machine. And, and uh, this was uh, 1997 when we still copied papers because uh, it was not available digitally. And if it would happen 2002, where I all, all paper, I downloaded digitally, so I wouldn't met him, but here he was this new guy on the floor. And then um, we were started to talk and then turn out that, you know, he wanted to make a, a HIV vaccine. I was working with RNA and we thought that we can try uh, work together and try whether mRNA would be a good vaccine. And so generating the gag mRNA and uh, delivering to human dendritic cells, uh, Drew was working with uh, human dendritic cells. This was a very new at that time, Ralph Steinman discovered. And uh, so he generated from uh, PBMCs and, uh, and uh, when he delivered the mRNA, I generated for this uh, gag specific mRNA. He was very happy because a lot of protein was produced from the RNA and uh, all of this uh, uh, activation marker of this uh, dendritic cells was up uh, and the inflammatory molecules were secreted by these cells. And of course, me, who was working in neurosurgery and wanted to use the RNA for therapeutic purposes, so coding for therapeutic protein, I was not happy that uh, this RNA I am making inflammatory. And so we drew, we decided that we will figure out why it is, because we were in, you know, even in 2000, when we published this paper, 2000, there were not known, only just, we knew that double-stranded RNA induced interferon. But even that time, it was not not known how, because it was 2001 when the first time toll-like receptor 3 was discovered and understand that double-stranded RNA activate toll-like receptor 3, and this is how interferon is in use. So how we try to figure out also that uh, how could it be, you know, the RNA which I am making, and I thought that the RNA I am making is the same which is inside all of our cells, is, uh, is inflammatory. And then we argue that maybe because the RNA is coming from outside to the immune cells, maybe it uh, senses as uh, injury related or invader or whatnot. So we wonder that whether the RNA, which is inside the cell, whether if we would take out and then now try to put into a, you know, a immune cells, whether it would be inflammatory. And this is what we did. And the next slide shows when we isolated, um, generated a monocyte derived and it says an isolated uh, uh, different kind of RNA from the mammalian cells. And uh, in purple, you can see that those are the in vitro transcribe RNA, which I was um, always doing in a, in a simple in vitro assay and, uh, and the isolated RNA in blue that uh, those were not as uh, inflammatory. We measured 
to the TNF alpha as uh, as a marker for it. And uh, the equal RNA was also quite um, uh, total RNA was quite inflammatory. And uh, so uh, we thought that maybe these RNA during the injury, you know, released from the cell, you know, they can instigate some inflammation. But uh, what was more interesting for us that the, the tRNA, you can see that the tRNA was not inflammatory at all. And in the next slide, you can see that the tRNA, and we knew that, has a lot of uh, um, uh, modification, nucleoside modification. So this is the thing which gave us the idea that could it be that nucleoside modification could suppress the immunogenicity of the RNA? And this is, uh, we try to answer that. And of course, how, how we could do that? How we could uh, make our mRNA and made in, incorporate a modification and which kind of modification we should uh, we should int induce. And the next slide, just to scare you a little bit, I show here what kind of modification there in an mRNA, and there are more than 100 different ones. And these are incorporated after the RNA is made from the four basic nucleotides synthesized in our body, different enzymes, they change and modify, and, uh, um, and those enzymes were not known. You, we just couldn't order to put somehow to our RNA and see that whether it will be less immunogenic. And um, so we didn't know what, what uh, how we should uh, proceed and came up the idea that um, we might have to order nucleoside uh, modified or uh, triphosphate, the modified nucleoside, which is uh, triphosphate on and try to incorporate to the RNA. So that was we have done. And, um, and the next slide shows that uh, what was commercially available, those uh, uh, five, 10, 10 different nucleoside triphosphate. And why we ordered this one only? Because we insisted that uh, we are just working with uh, uh, modified nucleosides, which is normally present in our body. And uh, the reason for that, because I remember from the early 90s, 93, when it was published that uh, uh, fluorinated uh, uridine containing, this called fialuridine, nucleoside, when they delivered uh, to a human from a clinical trial, five patients out of the 15 volunteers died. And uh, they did not understand for more than 10 years that why it happened, because this molecule was not toxic, not to the mice, not to the monkeys, not, not even more monkeys. So uh, it took, uh, uh, you know, in 2006, when finally it was realized that uh, there is a special nucleoside transporter, which is only present in the human. And this uh, middle of the coding sequence has a uh, mitochondrial localization signal. And what happened is that all of these uh, unnatural modified nucleosides were pumped into the mitochondria and the patient died from acidosis. So we want, don't want to do any kind of uh, unnatural one. We want to use only these uh, 10 different um, nucleoside triphosphate to make RNA with it uh, because it is present in our body and a human body would know how to handle it. Of course, we didn't know that whether it can incorporate by the uh, enzymes. So that's what we tried in the next slide shows uh, when uh, we were successfully could make uh, at least five of them to incorporate to the RNA. And uh, the next exciting step was to find out whether these RNA now that containing these uh, different modified nucleosides, whether they will be less immunogenic. Of course, you know, we were excited because we didn't know at that time, you know, whether we need all of the modification, which was in the tRNA or one of them. We didn't know how, what we would need. And the next slide uh, shows that um, uh, we were uh, very happy that um, finding that uh, some of these um, nucleoside modified containing RNA were not immunogenic. These were now measured in uh, isolated primary cells. These isolated primary dendritic cells, so it was not generated, so it was isolated from the blood. And then we found that those which had uh, modified uridine, those were uh, uh, not, uh, uh, not, not immunogenic. And uh, so we wonder that uh, maybe uridine is somehow nature selected that detecting and uh, uh, the immune cells detecting to uh, as a foreign material. 
But when it is pseudo-uridine, 5 methyl uridine, 2 thiouridine, or whatever it was, the uridine was modified, it was not immunogenic. Of course, we wanted to use, I wanted to use the RNA for coding for therapeutic protein. Drew wanted to use for vaccine, but both cases we needed that this RNA should be uh, translated. So the next slide shows that luckily we found that uh, uh, some of the uh, nucleoside modified uridine containing RNA was translatable. What was surprising is that the pseudo uridine containing uh, RNA translated so efficiently. 10 times more protein was produced than from the uh, conventional, which shows in the blue bar there. But the pseudo uridine translated very well in primary cells and all. And uh, whereas the two uh, tio uridine was not translated. So uh, subsequently, now that we focused all of our study to the pseudo uridine containing RNA. But when we did this, some experiment, we noticed that uh, we have some uh, uh, contamination present. So uh, the next slide shows that um, uh, when uh, uh, using the double standard RNA specific antibody, we could detect in a dot blocked assay uh, that uh, double standard RNA was present in, uh, in all of our uh, RNA transcripts. And so it took about two years and a lot of <laughs> work to figure out how to get rid of that double standard RNA, which finally we could uh, manage in 2011. And um, we uh, established an HPSE purification procedure and uh, we could purify the RNA. It was very important because in the light uh, blue, uh, the blue bars, you can see that uh, how much translation was improved when the RNA was uh, purified, modified. So finally, we could get a very uh, high quality RNA, which was nucleoside, modif nucleoside modified, which was uh, purified. And we moved on and the next slide shows that we want to see that whether we can, uh, this RNA can be translated in vivo. At that point, we used, uh, um, in the next slide shows, uh, that we used um, uh, transit to deliver in vivo to the animals. In that time, we didn't have the lipid nanoparticles. We just had uh, um, uh, this transit, which is uh, commercial available. And uh, what you can see in the low panel is uh, that when we use uh, pseudo uridine containing RNA and very small amount we injected to the animals, 0.1 microgram uh, mRNA, for a couple of days we could uh, measure uh, erythropoietin actually in the, in the blood. When we did experiment and we just injected uh, 0.1 microgram uh, messenger RNA coding for erythropoietin, which is responsible for red blood cell uh, differentiation, 30 minutes after injection, we already could measure the EPOPs present in the circulation. So the RNA is taken out by the cells instantly, translates instantly. The speed of translation is like five uh, amino acids per second. So depending on the length of the protein, you can detect very, very quickly. You can see on the blue line there that when we use the conventional uridine containing uh, uh, EPO mRNA, that not translated as efficiently. And these were all HPLC purified uh, uh, mRNA molecules. On the right panel, you can see that uh, when we injected this pseudo uridine containing RNA, the hematocrit of animals increased and the weekly injection, the very right panel shows that the weekly injection of uh, erythropoietin coding RNA, small amount uh, could maintain uh, hematopoietin at, at high level. So the RNA we injected, it was functional. I have to emphasize, of course, we didn't inject it in the kidney, we injected it intravenously. We were in, also did some studies where intramuscularly or sub Q we injected, and it didn't matter where we injected, we were always could measure uh, EPO uh, circulating in the blood and also the hematopoietic increase. The very important uh, uh, panel is in the middle one to show that even in animals, the uh, nucleoside modified RNA was not. Uh, immunogenic, whereas the uridine containing RNA was. This was uh, 2012 and uh, in that time, you know, it seemed that um, I have to move on and uh, I moved uh, to uh, BioNTech to Germany and next slide shows that um, although the new building was not there yet, we were on the campus and we were a very small company 
And um, I moved there because I wanted uh, to make messenger RNA coding for therapeutic protein and Uwur Zain established this company and he already uh, in 2012, <clears throat> already messenger RNA entered to, in a clinical trial for as a cancer vaccine. And, and I thought that if I want in my lifetime to see nucleoside modified RNA to as used as a therapeutic, I have to go to Germany and uh, try to do it here. Here in just showing one of the example when, when I was there, I, and I'm still there actually, uh, at the company that we started to make uh, bispecific antibodies. And uh, these are very short half-life uh, this um, uh, protein has. So the advantage of the mRNA in this case, not only that uh, it is very quickly, cheaply, the animal can translate the RNA and generate this bispecific antibody, but also that um, uh, this uh, short half-life, you know, that uh, due to the short half-life very frequently had to inject uh, to here in the animal, but in human already uh, the protein, the bispecific antibodies, human, human use, and uh, those uh, patient need uh, pump uh, put uh, to the arm, and then those, even the pump had to be filled up uh, every second day with this uh, protein. So it seemed that if they would have the RNA, they would not need a pump, and then they do not need uh, so, such a frequent injection. So here we show that uh, uh, it is uh, very effective, and uh, it was uh, uh, the bispecific antibody recognized partially the clothing six uh, um, tumor antigen and the uh, uh, CD3, so that uh, it put uh, close proximity the T cells and and, uh, uh, and the tumor cells. And we have uh, done a, a lot of study here. Actually, we moved there with the, with my colleague uh, Hiromi Muramatsu uh, from the from Penn, and um, we did a lot of study and uh, at the Two years, we were just doing the same thing we did at University of Pennsylvania, but now we had to do it a scalable manner, and so that was, uh, you know, one of our focus there. So that the, the purification, like the HPLC purification, couldn't be scaled up. So we had to come up with other type of purification. We uh, also had to, uh, you know, the capping uh, uh, of the messenger RNA, which is very critical to have a cap one here, also shown. Enzymatically, we put there what it was very tedious so that we have to come up uh, more uh, improvements. So the next slide shows what we were doing at uh, that time, you know, doing a lot of optimization. And uh, the three prime UTR, five prime UTR, uh, the coding sequence, so we did, um, and uh, when we did uh, all kind of uh, optimization, purification, we could uh, as the panel shows, we could have uh, from the mRNA made more protein, longer time, higher level. On the next slide, I will just show you that um, what uh, some codon optimization could result. So that uh, uh, we used uh, pseudouridine in our experiments so that when the uh, inflammatory uridine are there, you know, with uh, showing in blue here that, you know, the pseudouridine containing RNA would not be immunogenic, but uh, in some used, uh, instead of uh, uh, using pseudouridine, rather than eliminate the uridine from the messenger RNA. And uh, however, and, and that making the RNA GC rich, but um, one problem with this one that you cannot 100% eliminate uridine from the RNA because there are amino acid and uh, those uh, here that uh, half of the amino acid needs uridine uh, as, uh, to code. And some, you know, the phenylalanine need minimum of two uridine. So in every time, if you are doing codon optimization with this way, your, the RNA immunogenicity depends on what is the composition of uh, the protein you try to encode. And um, I also mentioned here two uh, reasons why I wouldn't codon optimize uh, actually uh, 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 for uh, um, infectious disease related vaccines because you might uh, lose with, uh, uh, with this optimization uh, uh, out of frame cryptic uh, epitope, which is very valuable, or you are generating a new epitope, which is useless. But um, so that's uh, optimization, codon optimization had to be handled very gently. While we were working actually in, um, in uh, 
uh, Germany, my colleague uh, here in Norbert Party, in the next slide shows, he was proceeding with um, uh, formulating a modified RNA to the lipid nanoparticles. And uh, he published this paper in, uh, together with uh, uh, Drew Weissman, and I was also included. And uh, this um, publication where uh, messenger RNA encoding the Zika virus specific uh, uh, proteins were done. And it was one, this was one methyl pseudouridine containing RNA, just like in the uh, COVID-19 vaccine. The lipid nanoparticle was very similar, made by aquitas, were formulated, and these were tested out in mice. And um, it was also in, in monkeys. And uh, it was very, very effective. And a single injection of uh, uh, this mRNA, this uh, uh, LMP mRNA protected uh, the mice. And a very small dose, 50 microgram, was also sufficient to uh, protect uh, the monkeys when it was challenged with the uh, Zika virus. And uh, I might mention that to today, the uh, BBVA award, which um, given out by uh, uh, Portugal uh, and um, for the best paper uh, of the year, for the looking at 10 years, uh, you know, what was, what was the, those paper which had the most impact? And uh, today this uh, uh, paper get the award for 2021 from the uh, BBVA award, because the importance that that was the first paper when lipid nanoparticle formulated uh, nucleoside modified mRNA was demonstrated that how powerful vaccine it could be. So from, uh, uh, we went on with uh, Norbert and uh, published and uh, performed more experiment. This was for Zika virus. It was also later with uh, uh, influenza and um, HIV. And uh, we also uh, demonstrated and uh, had proof why um, nucleoside modified RNA was critical. And uh, as recently as uh, this year, we also published uh, why it is was the lipid nanoparticle is critical. It is not just wrapping up the RNA, helping to protect, helping to deliver to the cell, entering to the endosome in the immune cells and helping to release it. But it is also containing the, it is an adjuvant, the uh, ionizable lipid as act as an adjuvant because the mRNA, messenger RNA, is not immunogenic. And uh, why it is important? Because the messenger RNA would induce, um, uh, if it is conventional RNA, it would induce interferon. And if the interferon induced, as we demonstrated, follicular T helper cells will be not present. And then result that there will be no good antibody response. Maybe you, good cellular response, uh, cellular immune response can be generated, but not uh, uh, antibody response. So this was the importance of LMP, the nucleoside modified RNA. And uh, as the next slide shows, and I don't have to tell you more about this because uh, we were sitting in the front of television and we knew when it was, you know, the sequence was, uh, uh, became available for the uh, SARS-CoV-2. We watched when, what happened when all of these companies started to, uh, 150 companies at the same time started to make a um, vaccine and how the phase one, the phase one, two and phase three trial ended. And uh, so uh, as a result of it, we know that uh, within a year, we already could have a, a vaccine, which is very safe and uh, and very effective. And uh, last year, August was uh, when it was uh, fully approved, uh, the uh, BioNTech-Pfizer vaccine. And uh, I might mention that it is a public domain that uh, BioNTech started to work with Pfizer in 2018 to develop uh, an influenza vaccine. So when people learn about, uh, you know, the development of messenger RNA for vaccine, they uh, thought that this, this is the first time, uh, you know, that uh, compound, this messenger RNA is used. Um, and as I told you already, were many, many studies were done. But uh, uh, many of you will not know, and the next slide shows, that actually the nucleoside modified mRNA was already in a clinical trial. The first patient actually was injected in February 5, 2018, with the messenger RNA coding for VGFA. 
And um, this study started actually from uh, Harvard and the uh, uh, university when uh, uh, Leo Zlangi and uh, uh, Kenneth Chen, you know, injected uh, VGFA mRNA to the uh, fa failing heart of mice and they demonstrated uh, the beneficial effect. And um, AstraZeneca and uh, Moderna uh, proceeded with uh, this finding and uh, Stood clinical trial was already underway, one of them using for wound healing for a necrotic wound of the diabetic patient, and the other was the heart failure treatment, which started prior to the COVID-19 vaccine. And the next slide shows that this was the most advanced, actually most advanced mRNA therapy uh, because um, it was um, uh, already in a phase two trial and uh, this year, January, we learned that uh, the uh, patient who participated in this uh, trial, and this was an uh, elective uh, coronary ar uh, artery bypass surgery, why uh, during the surgery they injected 30 uh, times uh, naked RNA coding for VGFA to, to the heart and this uh, on the slide on and with marker on the right, you can see those um, uh, labeling. And um, they injected the RNA and, uh, and uh, in, in the link there shown there is, uh, you can uh, hear the patient who are talking about uh, their experience that uh, how uh, their life was improved and their heart was performed so much better. And so now it is, uh, in, uh, this uh, clinical trial advances into phase three. So there is a success uh, already in, a, in other field of uh, this nucleoside modified RNA. This was also a one method of pseudo uridine containing RNA. And another field, is not, uh, not this was for the heart, another is was the next slide shows for, that was for the liver. And uh, in, uh, in this case, if the next slide please, in this case, uh, Cas9 mRNA was, uh, treatment was used by the Intelia company to treat this patient who had amyloidosis, transthyretin amyloidosis. And um, uh, this is a very uh, uh, serious disease. And um, there were already the uh, alnylam, actually, when they developed siRNA, that was the first what uh, they uh, targeted to treat this patient. And uh, what happened is that uh, they have a, a malfunctioning uh, um, protein um, uh, coded in the liver. And this uh, protein, when it is made, it is aggregate and then interrupting this uh, uh, production of this uh, toxic protein would be very critical. And of course, our nylon targeted the messenger RNA, but here the um, Intelia used the Cas9 RNA and the next slide shows that uh, they, uh, this uh, mRNA, what they delivered, they uh, contains uh, the mRNA codes for the Cas9 protein. The next slide, please. And, um, and then a uh, guide uh, RNA when it uh, delivers, uh, you know, inside the, the cell, the uh, Cas9 RNA translates to the protein and uh, complexing with the guide RNA finds the critical uh, target in the liver cells, the hepatocytes. And um, maybe the next slide shows that, how it interrupts and um, and eventually this toxic protein is not produced. And the result of this uh, trial, which was uh, published last year, is shown that the patient uh, uh, in, the blood in the blood, the level of this very toxic protein was uh, dropped. And uh, so here already three patients were permanently uh, treated and uh, cured. So that's another big success of this uh, nucleoside modified RNA use. I uh, mentioned here one more example because um, the next slide shows when intratumoral injection of mRNA was uh, used for cancer treatment. This is not the vaccine because the messenger RNA is not coding for a uh, cancer antigen, but rather it was cytokines, a mixture of cytokines. We performed this experiment and here in shown only <coughs> in animal studies on the mRNA coding for uh, IL-12, uh, in therefore, alpha, GMCSF, and IR15 sushi. And uh, 
this uh, messenger RNA when injected to the cell surface flows two more, like a melanoma in an animal setting, uh, then not only. Um, so, so what happened is that the tumor cell surface flows two more, which is cold, became hot because these cytokines locally were secreted, immune cells were rushed there, and then when they were in the circulation, then they could uh, eliminate uh, 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 distantly located uh, tumors. Here in the picture shows on the right that uh, it eliminated the uh, tumors from the lung. This uh, is just the animal studies I've shown. This is a uh, uh, <clears throat> Sanofi. It is advanced to uh, human trials and um, hopefully the uh, patient will be uh, cured by that. So we have to wait for the result. And uh, so then uh, Finally, I want just to mention to you that uh, in the last slide shows what is what is now is uh, 2022 and what is beyond. So I mentioned all of these clinical trials, which uh, which were successful. In addition to that, there are other uh, trials are ongoing when messenger RNA codes for uh, monoclonal antibodies. Uh, we already heard, you know, in the news, we can hear that uh, for HIV, for flu, already clinical trial using uh, nucleoside modified RNA LMP is already initiated uh, and first patient already injected. And uh, more genetic disease are targeted with using uh, uh, enzyme which can uh, add, edit the genome. The clinical, preclinical trial ongoing, and those are, and let's just say, try to mention here, even uh, four years ago, we already on the messenger RNA therapy meeting, we already heard about uh, using messenger RNA to vaccinate against malaria. Herpes simplex, I showed the data for uh, Zika virus. Uh, last year, we demonstrated that uh, uh, using uh, uh, multiple sclerosis specific uh, uh, autoantigens, uh, we could uh, tolerize, we could induce tolerization in, in two different uh, multiple sclerosis model animal. And uh, so this is also um, a, a new field. Um, uh, we published uh, how VGFC uh, can um, help uh, formation of new lymphoid vessel and, and uh, fight edema. And, uh, more uh, papers, like uh, just uh, last week was one about bone healing using a BMP specific uh, mRNA. So this is a platform, the messenger RNA uh, therapy is, this is a platform, many, many diseases can be treated. There are, uh, luckily, more attention was paid now. It is the advantages that it doesn't matter. It is a vaccine or any kind of uh, RNA. You can use the same settings, only the order of the nucleotides, which is incorporated based on the template is different, but uh, otherwise uh, the message is the same. Of course, the formulation is important and it is different because for, um, for a vaccine, when we are using messenger, when we are using a formulation, uh, lipid nanoparticle, those are containing the adjuvant, and maybe you know it is not useful useful for all. So for other formulation, for other other treatment, we have to use other formulation. Uh, with, for example, um, for tolerization, where we didn't want to activate the immune system. So. Uh, lot of effort was is uh, put on to make the formulation targeted to selected cell groups or organs and this is the future to make it more specific uh, the therapy but um, the other advantage of this mRNA therapy is that uh, it is affordable because uh, uh, of the human or the, or the patient will make the uh, uh, drug translate, which is the protein-based therapies are very expensive because uh, purification of the protein is very uh, tedious to figure out what is, uh, even if it is protein is the final drug for screening, it, the messenger RNA can accelerate tremendously the screening time because, uh, and uh, uh, goes through 
So um, many, many things can be done and uh, you will, and we will see the future that what it holds, but uh, now that more attention on the field and uh, more money is coming. So hopefully uh, a year from today, we can uh, talk about more successful uh, uh, clinical treatment. And uh, with that, the next slide just shows all of my colleagues and I want to thank them all for helping me on this journey and, uh, and those long, long <laughs> winding road that uh, I stayed. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Caroline. That was just such a thorough and extraordinary talk. You took us along on this whole journey from and through, throughout your own career and finally ending up at where we are today. So thank you for that. Um, what I wanted to ask you actually is, since we've covered your science in great detail, I wanted to ask you questions about, you know, the, the career, career in science and women in science and things of that nature. So let me start by asking you, first of all, you know, you, you left Hungary in 1985 and you moved to the United States and continued to pursue your research. What lessons would you share with others who want to immigrate to the US and uh, continue to pursue a career in science? And how does your experience compare to those who are trying to come to the United States and work in science today? Eighty-five was a long time ago. And uh, of course, a lot of things changed. And uh, so for me, when I think back that how important it was for me, like uh, being at the University of Pennsylvania, the number one importance for me was to listen to those lectures, that the best scientists came and I was just amazed. And every week I had to limit myself to listen not more than two lectures because otherwise I have to work in the lab. And, and uh, so, Today, you can be in your home country and you can listen to all of these lectures and, and, uh, and you can have access to all of these uh, uh, publications and others. So that's also a very important uh, part. And, um, but um, as, as um, you know, the, the process that you are coming to a country and, uh, and then all of a sudden everything is new, you have to adopt so quickly, you learn these things. And what is science? A every time we have a new problem, now we have to purify how we would make it. And then, you know, it is a good uh, exercise to, to learn that um, uh, how to quickly adopt and how quickly you can come up with solution for anything. First in life, because you have to adopt a new home, new uh, environment, and then mm -hmm. it is similarly in, in the laboratory, you know, that when you are doing uh, different things and, uh, you know, it is much, so, so what happened is a lot of people like to, you know, it is very comfy corner and they don't want to leave and they don't want to, and, and then it, you know, if they leave, then, you know, that's um, uh, <laughs> immediately, um, have a lot of, lot of experience. I, I personally never wanted to come here, but um, no, I don't mind, <laughs> obviously. But, so you're uh, back and forth always now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but um, so it is, uh, um, I like the open-minded, uh, you know, here in, in the United States, for example, that, uh, but maybe, you know, it changed also in other corners of the world, oh. but, uh, you know, that, uh, that everybody was so helpful, as I mentioned during the presentation, that the people who I never met, you know, they, they just sent in an envelope, we received the plasmid cut out and soaked in, you know, the little Batman people, because they were just want to help, and yeah. uh, so... It was uh, very uplifting. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that speaks to uh, an important topic that I know is close and dear to AAAS's heart and, you know, being discussed uh, all around the world. And that is the importance of international collaboration in the scientific enterprise. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Because, you know, especially during the pandemic, we saw a little bit of a rise in nationalistic sentiments, but really science flourishes when there's international collaborations and cross country cross-border science is very important, right? Your, your thoughts on that would be so welcome. Yes, so so this pandemic and, you know, I put uh, science in the spotlight and then 
realization that uh, collaboration is a must. And uh, so that uh, we can see or, already even every level, not just the uh, bench scientists who try to help each other, but we could see that uh, even the large companies, you know, if uh, the other company had a lipid expert and reached out, you know, to how to scale up uh, yeah. for example, the lipids. And, uh, and so it was, um, it was everybody's input. And if you, if you see that uh, um, our fellow Chinese scientists who sequence and then, then they distribute the data and, uh, and uh, uh, how it's it helping uh, everybody, uh, you know, to, to work together. And, and for me also moving uh, in, in um, Germany, actually, that um, in my team is very international. BioNTech is very international, like 57 nation was um, working there. And um, uh, women and men, I have more women worked there. And so it is, um, and then those uh, reaching out for more in the home country. I, I also try in, the, in the, now that I have more time, you know, to reach out back to Hungary and uh, maybe it will be uh, very um, effective. <laughs> My, well, yeah, that is, that, is, uh, that is great. And, you know, I think that this is what we've always seen and uh, it continues to see the international collaboration. You brought up a really great topic that's very close to my heart and that is the topic of women in science. Um, so you are one of those women in science who has just, you know, made, made it, made it uh, you know, to, to, to a place where people recognize you. Because a lot of times when you ask somebody to name a woman scientist, a famous woman scientist, people may not always think of it. What do you think we must continue to do to encourage more women and girls into careers in science? Yes, so I think that, um, you know, the children are curious and then, uh, and boys and girls equally curious. And, uh, and in school, you know, they are advancing uh, and, um, I, I don't know where the girls will fall out from this uh, process, but one obviously, of course, when they, you know, give birth and, uh, you know, they, it is hard for them, you know, to handle all of the job they need. And um, so for me, it was uh, uh, very helpful that, uh, uh, you know, we had affordable uh, childcare quality and affordable. That's what, uh, you know, one would be very important to have. And, um, and uh, I don't know that, uh, you know, I try to encourage also children and uh, girls and boys, it doesn't matter, you know, that do, do yeah. study, um, you know, science, because they have to realize what is this school is for, you know, that to realize that what do you like, what, what you would like to do in the rest of your life, and then they have to find that, and that's what the school for, you know, they do sports, do that and that, and they realize that what they like, mm -hmm. and uh, so that, um, of course, if they like this spotlight, spotlight which i am you know probably they want to be an actress or some performing art but you know, <laughs> they like uh, to solve problems and having fun with this and coming up every time to uh, figuring out something you know and having fun <laughs> then they should be a scientist and uh, so that's what i recommend them and i don't know if they want to be rich i don't know what they want what they should <laughs> but you know what they would do the money you know it is more having fun is uh, i think is more valuable and uh, and uh, having a goal to that your uh, research at the end help somebody is is the you know as ultimate uh, reward yeah, that is great that, you know, that it's because at the end of the day, science is fulfilling when it reaches society and solves a problem. And uh, you must be so thrilled to have, you know, something that you worked on almost your entire life to actually have had such a huge impact uh, on the world. What do you think the future is for biomedical research, um, both here in the United States and across the world? Um, so I, I am very optimistic because, uh, you know, I, I can see who are around us that, they, you know, very uh, bright uh, young people and uh, what we need more because there are so many things to discover. And uh, so I, I uh, hope that, um, I, I know that uh, I was not uh, funded, but uh, I can understand also that, um, you know, it is, um, 
you know, I was, um, I, I don't blame anybody for that. I just blame mm -hmm. myself. I did not to have not done <laughs> enough uh, preliminary data or not explain well enough and, and whatnot. So I, I hope that, um, more more money will be spent and because we realize you know that uh, here is a virus you know we cannot see it you need a certain uh, assay to detect and then it can stop our life on the way uh, we we knew it and so that we uh, not just uh, because of this but uh, that is uh, very uh, important to, to uh, in, invest into science and uh, there are so many diseases could be cured if we would put uh, more emphasis on it and and I know that the basic science is important and but the applied science and 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 I was a basic scientist but I was always thinking what it would be good for and good for you know <laughs> so that the who is performing the experiment maybe that's the person who can think of the application most likely. Mm -hmm. That is uh, that is excellent because you're right. I mean, we have not yet uh, scratched the surface of all of the healthcare challenges we need to solve. There are so many diseases that still need, uh, you know, therapeutics and um, and and vaccines and cures. Um, I have one last question because one of the things that we've all talked about is, despite this great wonderful thing about you know, vaccines and the vaccines are available for, for people, um, there is still hesitancy and there is still a little bit of hesitancy in believing the science. What do you think we as a society, especially as a community of scientists, can be doing to increase and enhance trust in science? Yes, so um, uh, uh, I, Sima, I realize um, that uh, we have not done a, go a good job in the past because we did not educate the, the public. We, we didn't talk about what the molecular biology is, is doing, what is the, what, what, where our science today, you know, on, uh, maybe it was uh, papers or something or articles about, but uh, not a simple language. And uh, we, and uh, maybe those who are making, uh, you know, films, is not, uh, they were not doing uh, about science. So that uh, that we have to do that, and we have to explain some simple simple way to to the people that um, uh, what is uh, what is the science, uh, what is the vaccine, how it acts, and and uh, one thing is also that to tell them that what we know, this we know, and that we don't know yet, and this is a process. This is you know, and then the honesty, which um, mm -hmm. you know, we we always as a scientist, we are always honest, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, but they, it, uh, you know, maybe it didn't come through to the people. And then those people who had more time who were just, uh, you know, hopping from uh, studio to studio and telling stupid thing and, you know, uh, anti-vaxxer because they didn't have to go to the laboratory to work. And so they spread uh, things which was absolutely not true. Yeah, you, I mean, you bring up a very good point about, you know, in the old days of molecular biology, we probably could have done a better job of explaining what is molecular biology and how it works? Um, that's a great point. Your hope for the future, what is your biggest hope for the future? And do you think that mRNAs will turn into therapeutics and are you working on that? <laughs> yes, of course, I believe that the RNA will be help for a lot of, you know, uh, treatment. Uh, of course, it will be not good for everything. The RNA, no matter how you wrap it up, it won't go through several layer of cells you know that um, but uh, it it can uh, have a lot of uh, treatment of a lot of diseases and uh, i i am very optimistic i was always uh, very optimistic uh, and um, and believe that uh, um, when i can see a uh, science uh, and uh, and uh, you know it really is um, not a, not a belief because you know <laughs> we we are scientists and we know the data and the, we look at the data and then we can conclude things. So, but I I am very optimistic. But uh, we have to work also to uh, you know inspire the new generation and uh, explaining to them that what we are doing and uh, so being in the spotlight right now that's what i try to do you know when i go out to to different countries to, to school children and and to to tell them about you know the excitement and 
uh, what uh, as, as a scientist we can experience and and I encourage them to find uh, what they like to do because you know if they like to do something else then that's what they should uh, select yeah. that is just fantastic advice and I'm so glad that you're using your time in the spotlight to continue to inspire the next generation into careers in science and I know that Everybody watching today and the entire AAAS community and the entire Johnson & Johnson community will be very happy because we're all about inspiring the next generation of science, as you know. And I also wanted to let the audience know that even though we are out of time, uh, I hope that you enjoyed, um, you know, Catalyne's uh, just phenomenally thorough, very good presentation and also the conversation we just now had. If you wanted to listen more to the conversation, then please go to the J&J YouTube channel where um, Kathleen and I actually had a much longer conversation uh, with each other in September when she won the Polly Anson Award. And so for that information, please go to the J&J YouTube channel. And for those of you who are here at um, AAAS, in case you were not able to watch this, the replays are going to be available. And so thank you very much to the AAAS community. Mm -hmm.